Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here, and I am back again with another Let's Edit with Avid Media Composer tutorial. And in this lesson, I want to take another step forward in talking about effects inside of Media Composer. And I want to talk about the timecode effect. The timecode effect is one of the other very common effects that everybody uses, no matter what nonlinear editing application that you're working on, because you will always need to send files for client approval and adding timecode burn-in to them is the easiest way to get back the most accurate information and the most accurate feedback because the client can simply jot down the timecode notes of where they want changes made and fire them back to you in an email. So in this lesson, we're not only gonna talk about that effect specifically, but at the end of the lesson, I'm gonna show you another great little trick that you can use to share not only that effect, but other elements across every project that's currently being worked on on your seat of Avid Media Composer. Now, as always, before we get rolling, I want to give a big shout out to Video Guys, our sponsor. Don't forget, if you're looking for Media Composer subscription licenses, head on down to the show notes below for the links. You can head on over to Video Guys website, get that coupon code of MC101 to get 5% off your subscription license. And as always, I want to remind you that if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one Media Composer training, you can always send me an email at kevinpmcauliffe at gmail.com. All of the lessons are recorded for you to save for your future reference. And I always give discounts if you want to get in and do multiple lessons to get you up to speed on whatever project you happen to be working on. And last but certainly not least, I want to remind you that if you find this tutorial useful, Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it across social media to help us get the word out there about Media Composer. To all those editors in Premiere or in Resolve who maybe need to jump into Media Composer and get a project done, or maybe you've just been away from Media Composer for a while and you just want to freshen up on, on some great tips and tricks, hopefully everybody can get something, whether it's a lot or even just that one little tidbit out of every lesson that we put up on the YouTube channel. All right, so as you can see, we are inside of Avid Media Composer. Here is our timeline. And here's, we actually have sort of two scenarios we're working in here. One scenario is that we have our fantastic edit here. And what we'd like to do is to either send this to the client, send it to the producer, to the director, for someone to actually give us feedback. Now, when you're looking for feedback, obviously the easiest way to get feedback is via timecode. Obviously, timecode's running, that's gonna represent our master timecode here, which matches down here. And the client will simply take notes and they'll send it back to us and say, oh, at you know, 25 minutes and 22 seconds, this shot doesn't work. And you sort of get the idea of the way that that works. So how are we going to go about doing this? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to utilize our time code effect. Now to find it very simple, very straightforward. If you remember back to our previous lesson where we talked about the 3D warp tool, this is going to be exactly the same. We can simply call up the effect palette, command or control in eight. You can come up to the search window right here, simply type in time code. I'm not going to do that, however, because I would like to show you that you can also simply navigate right down here to the generator category, and there is our time code burn in effect. Now, before we go on, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the concept of adjustment layers and how they work inside of Media Composer because we're going to actually be utilizing the adjustment layer concept here. You know, I've only got everything, all my video clips on one layer, but conceivably I could have, you know, five layers, 10 layers of video. And what I would like to do is to apply that time code effect easily across the entire timeline and not have to worry about applying it to individual clips. Well, that's where the concept of adjustment layers comes into play. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of an adjustment layer, think of an adjustment layer like a pane of glass that we're gonna put on the topmost layer of our timeline. All right, we could have one layer of video, we could have 10 layers of video with titles moving and effects and all this type of stuff. But what I would like to do in this example is I would like to blur everything that's gonna happen on all of the layers, whether it's one layer or 10 layers. And instead of going in and applying a blur to each one of those elements, what I'd like to do is to be able to simply apply that blur to our pane of glass that we put on the topmost layer. And obviously if you're taking a look through a blurry pane of glass, what happens to everything behind it? It all gets blurry. Same concept works here, except in other applications like in Resolve, you actually have to apply an adjustment layer generator. Whereas in Media Composer, conceivably every layer can be an adjustment layer. 
let me show you what I mean. What I'm going to do is simply add another layer of video and I'm simply going to take the time code effect and drag it and drop it down onto video track number two. You'll notice what Media Composer does is it immediately applies a filler and it applies the effect to that filler. Now you'll notice that nothing has happened on our screen because I'm simply not monitoring it over here on the left hand side. Now as soon as I call that monitor up on video track number two, you'll immediately see the time code appear. You'll notice the time code matches that of our master time code of our timeline at the top and over here on the left. And as I drag through, it's, well, I'm not going to say it's pretty much ready to go. It's a little bit on the tiny side. So let's get in and make an adjustment. But before we do that, let's just talk about sort of ideal locations for time code and other information on the screen. Because in some cases, people will put time code in the wrong place and it can become a little bit of a pain. So what do I mean by that? Well, I sort of say that the bottom, I don't know, maybe quarter, not even quarter, maybe sixth of the frame right here is off limits. And why is it off limits? Well, keep in mind, if you're sending your approvals via Frame.io or Vimeo or even you know private YouTube links, What's going to happen is as soon as they go to hit play, a little play bar here is going to come up over top of our footage and potentially over top of our time code, which can become a super annoyance when they're trying to pause. That bar is coming up. They're trying to read the time code. So what I normally tell people is that if you can, stay away from the bottom of the screen for putting that information in. If you got to put it in there, just raise it up just a little bit just so that when the play bar comes up here, it's not going to go over top of the time code, which can become exceptionally annoying and a little bit cumbersome when the producer or the client is just trying to play back video so that they can leave feedback. All right, so let's actually jump into the effect editor here. We remember this from the previous lesson. I'm simply going to click on the effect editor, bu editor button. I have it mapped to shift and Y on the keyboard. Obviously, that's going to be a common shortcut you're going to want to use. So I highly suggest mapping it to your keyboard for easy access to it. Now, you'll notice that we have the ability here to actually enter not only one area of information, but actually five different areas of information here. So the question is, what information can we display? Well, if I navigate up to the time code dropdown, you'll see that we can get in and, you know, display time code, source time code, edge code, source edge code, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But also what we can do is put information on the screen, like the sequences name, the source clips name, the sequences bin column, the source bin column. You'll see lots of information. We can also have the time code reference specific tracks. Now, for me, normally, I always keep it on the current track because keep in mind, this track represents the entire timeline in this specific situation. So if I apply it here, whatever the basically whatever the time of the time bar is right here, is what's going to be displayed in the actual effect. All right, uh, let's now come over here. What I want to do is just adjust its appearance and its position just a little bit. So what I'm going to do is actually just adjust the font size. I don't want to make it too big. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place it up here in the upper left hand corner. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add an additional layer or an additional, we'll call it time code window, I guess. But what I'm going to do is simply turn on display two because what I do want to make sure of is that the client always knows what they're watching. I'm just going to drop down position here and I'm going to drop this down. And what I would like to do is to actually display the sequences name. Perfect. You'll see we're at 44 size, 44 pixels. There we go. And what I'm going to do is simply just match its X value here, which is minus. Actually, it's right here. It's a minus 462. So I'm just going to punch in minus 462. And then we can just adjust the Y position to match here. Now, I don't remember if the widget actually lets me just move it north. Now it wants to move it all over the place. So let me just undo that. I'm just going to bring it up roughly to about here. Perfect. And you can see now what we have, if I step out of effects mode and I come back and hit play, is really all of the information that the client's going to need to give us feedback on our edit in our timeline. All right, now let's take this concept one step further because I've been looking at this on an entire timeline level. However, in many cases, what you're going to need to do with footage in your timeline is you're going to need to put very specific information on each shot. Basically, the source's time code, the source clip's name, and potentially other information as well on a shot-by-shot -shot basis. This is why I showed you to do this in two steps as opposed to attempting to do everything 
inside of the one effect. It's just so much easier to do this. And at the end of the lesson, I'm going to show you something else that's really going to benefit you, especially in situations like this, when it comes to applying effects quickly, okay, and across multiple projects. So what I'm going to do is simply take that time code burn in effect. I'm going to take it, drag it, and drop it down onto our scene A angle one, take two, all right? What I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to turn on the topmost layer so that we can see it. And what I'm going to do is step back into effects mode, making sure I have only video track one selected. So now here's where we're going to get in. And we're actually going to change this time code information to match that of the source's time code. Now you'll see, because all these shots basically start at the zero hour mark, uh, they're all going to look very similar to each other. But keep in mind, in a lot of cases, if you're working with footage that was shot on location, all these time codes are going to be completely different. Now, one thing I do want to check here is I'm just going to keep the size about the same. It was about 44, I think. So we can go 44. And maybe what we want to do with this one is with this one, maybe we want to stick this one in the upper right-hand corner, for example. Okay. And I'm just going to position that there. And of course, what I'm going to do is come down to display number two. I'm simply going to turn that on and we're going to make this our source clips name. And again, we're going to make this size 44. Perfect. I'm going to position it where it needs to go in the upper left hand corner. Now, keep in mind, in this case, maybe we want to right justify everything. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of what we're doing. I'm just going to line everything up like such. Again, you can obviously be as nice and neat as you would like to be. And what I encourage you to do is to take the time the first time you do this to get everything looking the way that you want. Now, you might be thinking, well, Kev, why would I even do that and why do I even care? Well, I'm going to show you in just one second here. Let me just see if there's any other information we might need here. I'll just come down to display three. I don't think I need anything else, but I do want to show you one that's also very cool. And that is right down here, the text window. All right, now I'm just going to drop appearance down. Now, why would we care about the text window? Well, let me show you. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to come in and I'm going to type in, this is the property of, you know, KPM, even though it's not. It's obviously the footage is courtesy of CineStudy, but what this is actually going to let me do as well is to actually create a watermark right here in the middle of our screen like this. Okay. And what I probably should have done is I should have said, this is the property of Cine Study. Let's just be correct here. There we go. Very nice. Okay. And you'll see that we can get in, adjust the position. I can adjust the line weight, the outline. I can use, you know, even get in, change the font to whatever I want it to be. I can even get in and adjust the background. But you see that with the time code effect, this is actually a very, very versatile effect, more versatile than you might think that it is to get in and actually display all of the information that you need to display on whether it's the timeline or specific shots in your timeline. Because now what we can do is I can come back here and we talked about this a little bit in the previous lesson, I believe. When I want to take this effect and I'd like to apply it to every shot in the timeline, all I have to do is simply take it, bring it into a bin. We'll just say that bin is actually, we should have put it in my graphics bin here. Let's just do that just so we can stay as organized as we possibly can. Then all I have to do is simply step into effects mode, bring this like this, and then simply double click on that time code effect to apply it across every shot in my timeline. Now I did say that I was going to take this one step further. And you might have thought by me showing you what I already showed you in the previous lesson by simply selecting all of these clips in effects mode and then double clicking and applying the effect to all of them was what I was going to show you, but it is not. This effect is a very common effect. And actually these two effects, the two time code effects, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this time code effect and I'm simply going to drag it over here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call it TC burn in timeline. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the next one and I'm going to call it TC burn in clip. Okay. And you're going to see where I'm going with this in just a second. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now close that window because in here, I'm starting to gather some very common effects that maybe I'd like to use. Like for example, let's say I'm working on a series. Okay. The series is going to have 10 episodes. 
I've now gotten in, I've started to create some really cool effects that I know that I'm going to want to use in other projects, all right? Other projects on this system, okay? Now, how we used to do this was we would create a bin that would be called elements, graphics, whatever we would call it. And then we would copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And we'd put it into every project and we'd open it. So this way we'd have access to things like the time code effect or a dip to color or maybe a slate in here uh, that was easily accessible across the different projects. We actually don't have to do that anymore. Now, why don't we have to do that anymore? Because there's a feature called favorite bin that we can now utilize so that we can take this bin and make it accessible across any project inside of Media Composer. So how do we do that? Well, with the graphics bin selected, I'm going to navigate up to the bin dropdown. And if you take a look about half to two thirds of the way down, you're going to notice that we actually have a feature right here called add bin to favorites. Now, as soon as I do that, you're going to notice that a new folder has appeared called appropriately enough favorite bins. If I take that bin and I, or that folder and I twirl it down, you'll notice that that graphics bin our graphics bin that's currently open lives inside of favorite bins. Now you'll see that if I close that, it's going to close inside of favorite bin as well. Now what I am going to do here is I'm actually going to close Media Composer. What I am going to do is simply just make a new project. It doesn't matter what it's called. I'm just, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call it favorite bin. Doesn't matter anything else that we set in here. I'm simply going to say create. And you'll notice that once the project has created and opened, what do I have as the only, well, I guess the other bin that I have in my bin, other than the default bin that's created, is I have that folder with that graphics fault, with that graphics bin in it that has all of the clips that live in that bin that I can now access across any project that I currently work on. Now, keep in mind, if I was to navigate up to that graphics bin and I was to hit delete, you'll notice that it hasn't been removed from here. It still lives in here under other bins, all right? What I'm gonna do is simply just close that window and I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna come back to our first project and you'll notice that inside of our first project, I don't have the graphics bin inside of favorites anymore, but it hasn't been deleted. Still lives there, just not part of favorites. So at any time, if I wanted to add it back, I could simply, with that bin selected here, let's just make sure it's open here, there we go. I can navigate back to bin, set it to bin favorites. It's now gonna appear across any project. And keep in mind, this could just be for graphics, but you might have one for sound effects, music, uh, elements. You could get in and create a default project specifically for your elements, including things like the time code burn effect, the dip to color, any graphics you might use like slates and things that are going to be common across projects, then have other bins for music, sound effects, and things like that. Stick them all into favorite bins, and now you'll be able to access them across every project that's worked on on this seat of Avid Media Composer. All right, now as always, I wanna give a big shout out to our sponsor, Video Guys. Don't forget, if you're looking for those Media Composer subscription licenses, you can check out the links in the show notes below. Use that coupon code of MC101 to get 5% off your Media Composer license purchase. And as always, if you have any questions, and this tutorial actually came about from a viewer question, don't hesitate to send those questions to me at kevinpmcauliffe at gmail.com. Thanks a lot for watching.